to introduce today's speaker, David Spurgel. Uh, David got his uh, PhD at Harvard University, Center for Astrophysics, and stayed local, so he went to the IES, Institute of Advanced Studies, after which he became faculty at Princeton, um, where he's at since 87. Um, so David is um, a theoretical cosmologist, and the only theoretical cosmologist I know who actually built his own coronagraph to study exosolar planets. So that's a very special skill set to have. Um, for his work in theoretical cosmology, he's received a number of prizes and awards, such as the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, uh, the Shaw Prize, and as part of the WMAP team, the Gruber Prize for cosmology. Uh, today will tell us more about how we can test inflation with a number of exciting experiments, including the recent one, which is called BICEP, BICEP 2, uh, that had uh, announced um, the discovery of remote polarization in the CMD data, so the relic radiation of the, of the Big Bang. And after today's lunch, um, I might say um, interesting uh, uh, discovery, but yet to be confirmed. Right. So uh, a movie that I would uh, recommend, just thinking about this, uh, uh, so I was teaching, talking about this to my grad, in my graduate class, is um, Bull Durham. And uh, that one of my favorite scenes in Bull Durham is when he teaches uh, the ca experienced catcher teaches the young player important phrases that you need to know. So whenever you're interviewed, you say, just glad to be here, just want to help the team. If you, you know, just want to give 110%. I told them the phrase you're supposed to say whenever you hear an exciting new result, important if true. <laughs> so, um, but I think a lot of things, it may turn out to be true, but what I want to do first is just give an overview of where we are in CMB. Um, I'm actually going to begin, <laughs> in a sense, by giving a, a five or ten minute version of the talk I planned to give a week ago, before the BICEP2 results came out. And just ta talk a, a little bit about Planck, some about our recent work reanalyzing Planck. Um, but now let's talk about it um, as a, to set up a uh, discussion of inflation, what the inflationary predictions are, what tests we've done of inflation already, how the inflationary model predicts gravitational waves and why the BICEP results are so exciting for cosmology, and then look ahead to the future. So I want to begin with sort of the high level th things that I want you to take away from the, the talk about just the overall state of cosmology. And in a sense, this is, slide is meant uh, for, uh, you know, you're a soft condensed matter physicist, you want to know what do they actually know in cosmology. My view of what I think we actually know is we have a fairly simple model, one with only a handful of parameters, five parameters, the density of atoms, the density of matter, how lumpy the universe is, how that lumpiness varies with scale, the age of the universe, and with those parameters, which we've now measured pretty well, and with some basic ingredients, ingredients that are consistent with the inflationary model, uh, adiabatic, scale invariant, Gaussian fluctuations, I'll talk about what all those mean, um, nearly scale invariant spectrum of fluctuations, consistent with the ideas of inflation, and now gravity waves, we can fit a host of astronomical data. And we can, you know, with a very simple model, fit a very rich set of data uh, with, you know, uh, data from things like the Sloan survey, measurements uh, from the Hubble telescope. I won't talk at all about those kinds of astronomical measurements, but you should keep in mind that this basic model fits all those pieces. What I want to focus on are measurements of the microwave background. And again, the high level picture that I want to take away is we're very fortunate. I you know, consider myself really lucky to be working in this field at the time at which the data continues to improve at a remarkable pace. 
things that we thought were not measurable a decade or so ago, or two, um, we now measure to precision. And there's this ongoing sense of progress, and this just shows how well things are agreeing between experiments generally. So this plot here shows, uh, ah, there we go, Is it, got my batteries in? Yes. Okay, good. Um, these are Planck measurements of temperature fluctuations on just a very small patch of the sky. Kind of zoom in on it. Here's measurements taken from Chile with polarization vectors on it from the ACCOL satellite. This measurement is done through from space with a set of uh, bolometers. This is done with TESs from the ground sitting in Chile. Completely different experimental setup and you see the same thing. And this is true with a host of experiments. So these are show observations from the Planck satellite, the European satellite with key components from here in the US that's measured the sky at high resolution. Here are earlier observations that we took from WMAP. The Planck measurements have been, on uh, WMAP measurements here are smooth the same scale. Planck actually has information on higher resolution that's hard to see in a plot like this. But you can, the, you know, one of the things I want you to take away from this is the remarkable agreement we have between independent experiments at this point making these measurements. And this shows a measurement of the angular power spectrum of temperature fluctuations versus scale. What's plotted on this axis is multiple number. This is amplitude of temperature fluctuations, the RMS temperature fluctuations, the angular power spectrum. And the red points here come from correlating WMAP with Planck. Sorry, actually red here is Planck with Planck and black is WMAP with Planck. And you can see multiple by multiple, the two maps agree remarkably well. This shows the, uh, roughly the current state of play. The blue points here show, uh, before Planck, the measurements from WMAP showing the angular power spectrum, the peaks from the acoustic fluctuations. The green points, measurements from the ACT experiment in Chile. The red points from the South Pole Telescope. And you, the curve here is our theoretical prediction for a, a universe with a nearly scale uh, invariant spectrum of fluctuations, a universe filled with dark matter and with vacuum energy. And you can see that the theory and the data improve, uh, agree quite well. How and many parameters? There are uh, five parameters in the model. And then, um, so you have five parameters, the, um, but then those same parameters are all you have when you go to fit the galaxy power spectrum measurements of the Hubble constant, the age of the universe. So we have many different ways of checking those five parameters. You, you, you could take all of them from other experiments and have a no parameter fit here. That's correct. And it wouldn't really yeah, the other, change much. It wouldn't change much. The uncertainties, the uncertainties from the other experiments are bigger. Yeah. So for example, you know, the measurements of the Hubble constant, uh, the expand, um, might have an uncertainty of, you know, five or six percent from other measurements and here more like two percent. You can infer the density of baryons from the abundance of deuterium. That would have a 10% uncertainty when you apply it here. So it's the uncertainty in the theoretical curve which would change. Would change, but the, the, right, but the centroid would stay the same, pretty much. Um, so it's a consistent universe, but a strange one for some reason, or maybe, ah. Does this do this? Ah, there we go. Uh, so we can go back and forth and now add the Planck points. You can see when the Planck data came in, higher precision here still agrees very well with the theory. Very consistent. Now if you look very carefully, and this was going to be my talk before BICEP, there's some deviations here. And those deviations are statistically significant between the experiments and was something that worried me. 
Uh, and the these agree quite well, point by point. The difference here is actually what fraction of the sky is used. So if you actually look at the same part of the sky, the agreement here is, is really remarkably good. The teams made different choices on how much of the galaxy they included. Now, and you go to look at these parameters. Here's these basic parameters. This is what we inferred before Planck. This is the measurements from Planck. And you can see on measurements of things like the spectrum of fluctuations, how much matter there are, there is in the universe, how many atoms there are, how fast it's expanding. Really quite good agreement. Um, and the high level thing is that things agree quite well. For someone like me working in the field, I actually got worried, and still am, well, I think I understand it, but concerned about these shifts, because you're actually looking at the same region of the sky. So you should not see shifts in cosmological parameters. And in fact, and I won't go into the story in too much detail, I believe the problem comes from the Planck 217 gigahertz channel. During its first month of operation, there was um, correlated noise due to the, uh, it was sitting in a bolometer that produced correlated noise in the maps. If you analyze the Planck data, taking cross correlations between channels observed at the same time, the T Planck team treated them as independent. They were in fact had correlated noise that produced some erroneous signal. If you throw out the 217 channel, or alternatively just take th measurements observed at different times, you get thing numbers that I'll show shortly that are very consistent. Uh, and the indicator of this, and this is why I want to point, uh, use this as a lesson how you can trace things down from test failures. This is a null test where the Planck team took its 100 gigahertz data from one season minus the other season very consistent. 143, very consistent. Here's the difference in the power spectrum between one season and the other at 217. And you notice there's some inconsistencies here. And it's this inconsistency that was the smoking gun that motivated um, our work with, to focus in on that and see what's going on. And this is work done with two postdocs at Princeton, Raphael Flauger and Rene Lozek. And I think for some of you in the, um, Raphael's talk somewhat about this work here. Uh, but um, what we did was we first began by removing the 217, then found without the 217 channel, remarkably good agreement with the earlier measurements. We checked internal consistency and asked, this is the best fit parameter without 217 using their data asked what, how, how much we would expect the parameters to shift. These are 500 realizations of the Planck data. And in no realization did the parameters shift as much as we saw. And when we threw out the autocorrelations, everything's remained consistent. And the re one reason I want to introduce that is to talk about the importance of null tests. The other, because we go to our theoretical interpretation, you know, bef uh, Those are cosmic variance errors. Whereas here, this is just doing one realization of the sky. It's our, our sky, exactly. So. I see. So, so it looks consistent, but it's actually more consistent. That's right. Given that we look at one sky, 217 should see the same parameters as 143. And that, that, that test was not, had not been done consistently by the Planck team. And one reason I want to set that up was because one of the things we did was we made based on the Planck numbers, what the best value is for the amplitude of fluctuations as a function of scale and the amplitude of gravitational waves. And the curves shift from the green curve to the blue curve. And when we go to look at the bicep results, our interpretation will actually change a little bit between the green and the blue. And this is some stuff we had published before they came out. All right, so now let me turn, step back from Planck and talk about the ideas of inflation. And I want to spend about five minutes just motivating why cosmologists take the ideas of inflation seriously. So let me begin with the problems of standard Big Bang cosmology. And I think of the problem of the standard Big Bang cosmology is, 
I look at the sky here, I look at the sky there, and they have basically the same temperature. It's like all these students handing in the same test. It suggests communication took place. <laughs> Somehow information got from there to there. That's hard to understand because not in standard Big Bang cosmology, this part of the sky and this part of the sky were never in causal contact. There was no information um, for information to get from, you know, here's the space-time diagram to get from this region to this region. Yet we see coherent fluctuations across these, <coughs> these scales. So, it's hard to understand why things are so uniform. But maybe there's some mechanism to make it uniform. Then we have to understand, well, they're not perfectly uniform. Those tests were not exactly the same. They differed by about 0.01% in terms of what the amplitude of fluctuations are. So we need a universe that is not for, uh, perfectly smooth, but has small variations in its density. Otherwise, we have no mechanism for understanding how galaxies form. Another problem with the standard cosmology is a problem we call the flatness problem. We don't, un you know, in the standard cosmology without inflation, we basically have one scale set by the Planck time and the Planck scale. And the universe is obviously much bigger than the Planck scale and much older than the Planck time. So there must be something else setting that. Um, you know, we don't know why the density of the universe in the standard cosmology is so close to zero, uh, total energy is so close to zero. Um, our universe in sort of standard homogeneous models could either be slightly positively curved or slightly negatively curved or flat. Positively curved universe uh, collap uh, collapses on itself a negatively curved universe expands forever, becomes less and less dense. This flat universe is an unstable fixed point. And without inflation, it seems very strange that it sits there. These are sort of classic problems in cosmology. And when particle physicists started thinking about fundamental physics in the early universe, they introduced a new problem because they start thinking about what happens with phase transitions in the early universe, you know, thinking that you know, the standard model we see at low energies is um, probably the product of symmetry breaking from some higher order symmetry. And when you have the symmetry breaking, you're going to form monopoles. And the universe ought to be filled with monopoles. And back when the idea of inflation was introduced in the 80s, all these problems existed. It was Alan Guth who recognized that these phase transitions weren't the problem, they were the solution. And in fact, from those ideas developed the now standard inflationary model, a new inflation thing, this picture, where the universe went through a period of time where it was in close to a de Sitter state, it underwent a period of super expansion, where it uh, expanded super luminally, grew to be very large, then reheated, and that give, gave rise to the energy in our Big Bang. This solves no, the basic problems of the standard Big Bang cosmology. It solves the horizon problem, because things get stretched very large. It solves the flatness problem, because you take some small region and stretch it very big. As you stretch things very big, this enormous expansion suppresses the curvature term. I think about it as taking a tiny volume and stretching it. When you stretch a tiny volume, it always ends up looking close to flat. But as you stretch things so much, you solve the problem of initial conditions and monopoles, you dilute everything and are left with just this vacuum energy density. And for our discussion today, one of the really nice features of this inflationary model is different regions of the sky undergo slightly different amounts of inflation. Just quantum fluctuations in the density from here to there means that region's a little denser. It will inflate a little bit more. 
and that will give rise to larger amplitude fluctuations. And these variations in expansion rate give rise to the fluctuations we see in the microwave sky and the fluctuations that grow to form galaxies and the fluctuations that grow to form us. So, another nice feature of the inflationary model is that during inflation, any massive field is going to experience these quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations, and the graviton is another massless field that's floating around there, um, is going to generate fluctuations at, you know, the de Sitter temperature. If we know the expansion rate during inflation, we can predict the level of gravitational waves are turning it around. If we can measure the gravitational wave amplitude, we know how fast the universe is expanding during inflation. So, so far, this is a nice fairy tale. Uh, and this was what it seemed like to me when I first learned this in the 1980s. Because it was a fairy tale that made a bunch of predictions, some of which didn't seem consistent with our observed universe. Predicted universe that was flat. Back in the 1980s, the best measurements of the density of matter said that the density of matter was about 0.2, 0.3. Those turned out to be right. What we were missing back then was the re rest of the energy was in the form of vacuum energy. And our universe wasn't, is in fact flat. Predicted a spectrum of nearly scale invariant fluctuations, Gaussian fluctuations, adiabatic fluctuations, I'll talk about what these all imply, superhorizon fluctuations. So Gaussian fluctuations mean that the probability distribution of the fluctuations are drawn from a Gaussian. They're Gaussian random phase fluctuations. Uh, you basically specify all the properties of the fluctuations we see with a handful of numbers. The fluctuations are adiabatic. By that I mean that the ratio of photons to electrons to protons to dark matter is constant across space. And the fluctuations are superhorizon. That goes to this idea that there are fluctuations here and fluctuations here that are connected. And those scales were, not, uh, were, were, were previously not connected to each other. And I took this slide from, uh, as I was modifying my talk, from some, an old talk from about eight years ago. It's always fun to do. And put checks next to all those. But so I felt with the WMAP data, we had shown these five checks. And said so the next, the big test is gravitational waves. So what you call gravitation, I should write about gravity waves. Um, and let me first talk about those first five tests and then turn to gravitational waves. So let's... Can I ask you, sir? Sure. So in the previous transparency, uh, you meant massless fields. Ma oh, I, I, did I write massive? You wrote massless. I meant massless. Okay. Sorry, so, massless fields. Okay. Absolutely. This is what happens when you rewrite lots of transparencies in, an hour before you talk when you realize you have to write introductory transparencies. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, these are our measurements of the curvature of the universe. This is the cur a flat universe. This is from five years of WMAP data. Uh, n now, with Planck data, we've measured this to even higher precision. So, just to give you a sense of how well we have measured the curvature of the universe, where mega curvature equals zero is a flat universe, these are measurements from Planck using the WMAP polarization. It's quite close to zero. Here's the 95% confidence limits. This is combining the Planck data with measurements of baryon acoustic oscillations from the Sloan survey. Combining Planck with measurements from ACT and SPT that I showed earlier. And then combining them all. And you can see that things have been measured to quite high precision. And now with measurements of gravitational lensing, which are what's used here, one could measure things and show that the universe is flat just with CMB data. So it looks like the universe is very close to flat. Omega curvature is very close to zero. The fluctuations look remarkably Gaussian. This is the PDF of the fluctuations measured in WMAP, smoothed on the four degree scale, the one degree scale, and the quarter degree scale, and the dashed line is a Gaussian, 
and the curve's a histogram. And you can see that the fluctuations really look very nicely Gaussian out to kind of five sigma. And we can quantify that in a number of different ways. You can look at statistics like Minkowski functionals, which look nice in Gaussian. Or a way that we like to do in cosmology is quantify the non-Gaussianity by looking at various measurements of the three-point function. Um, we, we usually call this in terms of F and L. And this is something where back when we made our first measurements of the amplitude of non-Gaussianity, F and L from the Kobe data, uh, you know, uh, Ben Wandel, the Chiro Komatsu, when I showed it was, you know, plus or minus a thousand, but consistent with zero. With uh, WMAP, we were able to show it was plus or minus 20. And now with Planck, it's sort of plus or minus six. And this is sort of, uh, you know, in, should be multiplied by the amplitude of fluctuations, 10 to the minus four. So these fluctuations can be thought as being Gaussian to better than a, a part in a thousand close to a part in 10,000. Yeah? Sorry, this is a stupid question, but what else than a Gaussian you would expect? Um, well, if things are uh, weakly coupled random fields, it'd be Gaussian. But if there's anything that produces a coupling, if there's a anything local that generated the fluctuations, explosions would make it non-Gaussian. Cosmic string defects, cosmic strings would make it non-Gaussian. So uh, any process that's uh, not something like where you have many small steps that are quantum mechanical. It's not shared by all the stacks. So it's, okay. you know, so uh, anything that's not, right. So, you know, there are other ways of generating Gaussian fluctuations than this, but uh, the model made a very specific prediction and it didn't have to be that way. The model predicts that the fluctuations are adiabatic. So that means that the um, ratio of electrons to photons to dark matter is constant. And adiabatic fluctuations um, make a very uh, set prediction for the shape of the spectrum. And one nice test of the model is we can fit the parameters to the temperature spectrum. And assuming that's adiabatic, predict the correlation between temperature and polarization. So now we have no free parameters in going from the temperature measurements to the polarization measurements. And here are measurements from WMAP of temperature and polarization. And then with the same model, now Planck, with its higher sensitivity, has very nice measurements of polarization polarization. And here's the EE measurements in Planck, again consistent with the fluctuations being adiabatic. And then finally, we can go look for whether the fluctuations vary with scale. A scale invariant spectrum in this notation is n equals 1, which would have the same amplitude of fluctuations in all scales. The simplest inflationary models predict n should be close to 1, but not quite 1. And the best fit values for n are around 0 0.96, 0 0.97, close to 1, but now the data is so good that we can clearly distinguish it from one. Something that was about four or five sigma in W maps, maybe about six, seven, in, but without with Planck. So to go further, yeah. Yeah, the Planck release is blue. Our reanalysis is purple. So it shifts it by a bit. So this is one of these things where if you want a high level view, eh, those are about the same. If you, want, if you care about the details, it's a shift of about a sigma and uh, it matters uh, for certain analyses. The response of the Planck team to our reanalysis, I view it as basically going through the three classic stages of any paper. First, they said it was wrong. Then they said it was trivial. And now, so when, they first said, and now they said they did it first. So the first stage was they disagreed with us. Then they said, oh, those are really tiny shifts. They're trivial. And now they say, yeah, we knew those problems were there already. So, but that's good. 
So for the rest of my talk, I want to focus on polarization. And because, it's because by measuring polarization, we can look for these gravitational waves, the sort of next big prediction of the inflationary model, and one that we were uh, kind of all geared and excited about for a long time, the possibility of looking for this. And to explain what we're doing in polarization, let me just remind you, in electron-photon scattering, if you have photon coming in with these two polarizations, the one that scatters in this direction comes out with that polarization. So if I'm an electron here, if I have two photons coming in, a photon coming in from this way, it scatters to you with that polarization. This way scatters to you with that polarization. This photon scatters with that polarization, this one with that polarization. So if I'm the electron at the surface of last scatter, if I see a temperature quadrupole, so hotter on this side, colder up and below, you'll see a polarized signal like this. So scattering will convert a temperature quadrupole into polarization. If I have fluctuations in the density of the universe, those fluctuations, so this is a wave where it's denser here, less dense there, will give rise to a pattern of polarization. So if I have hot and cold spots, I'll have a polarization pattern like this generated by the hot and cold spots. And the variations in density that we looked at in WMAP and Planck all have this form, and they generate what we call E-like patterns of polarization. So this is what comes out of density fluctuations. These E-like patterns are symmetric under mirror reflection. You take this picture, you rotate in the mirror, it looks the same. Polarization patterns can be decomposed into E-like pieces that are symmetric and B-like pieces that are anti-symmetric. Density fluctuations generate only E-like fluctuations in the microwave sky. Gravitational waves don't care about this symmetry. They generate equal numbers of E and B modes. As a gravitational wave propagates through space, it makes electrons move. Moving electrons will scatter photons, and then when they scatter again, that will produce a polarization pattern. So the plan is to look for these B modes as they will be the distinctive signature of gravitational waves. Before you showed polarization data, I was showing only E. Right, that was, that was the point. I was confused. Yeah. You were saying you were showing E. I was showing only E. I was, uh, and we'll go back and look at E, some, the e data some more. Um, but first, I just want to remind you, these, uh, these E and B modes um, are kind of global properties of polarization. We have to reflect them in mirrors and things and look at patterns. At an individual point, I really want to specify uh, the, the Q and U parts of polarization, right? And then the standard notation, you know, we write them relative to galactic coordinates. And this is actually what the polarization pattern looks like when you make a map of the sky. So this is a map of the microwave sky. And I, what I want to <laughs> hint at with this is there are other things that generate polarization besides the microwave sky. This polarization pattern you see here is generated by the galactic magnetic field. And this is synchrotron emission, which is far brighter at 23 gigahertz than, this is the WMAP measurements at those frequencies, than anything we see in the CMB. So what we do is we make use, in, for example, in WMAP, of multiple frequency data. As we go up in frequency, the synchrotron intensity gets drops. You see almost all the emissions now coming from the galaxy. And you're starting to be dominated by cosmological fluctuations here. And by the time you get to these higher frequencies, it's mostly cosmological, but there still is some galactic component. And then you need to worry about 94 gigahertz. So if you want to study polarization, and this is a slide I wrote eight years ago, is if you want to study polarization, you need at least three frequencies, is what we said. 
because you need to distinguish the CMB from synchrotron and dust. Once you've got that polarization, you can start looking for things, and this is going back to the E modes, like these superhorizon fluctuations. Because polarization is only going to be generated when scattering takes place. So we, need, we know that the polarization measurements are coming basically from the surface of last scatter. So if I see a po temperature and polarization being correlated here and here on these large scales, that requires that there was something that set them up early. That alone, the fact that we saw these large scale temperature and polarization fluctuations, already told us that we had to have super horizon fluctuations. We need a mechanism either like inflation or something else that set it up in initial conditions. And just to say a little bit more about these fluctuations, the way we've actually in the past have looked at this is by combining things and looking for correlations between the temperature and polarization patterns in ways that convince us that we're looking at E-modes. Before I get to gravitational waves, I want to say a little bit about another mechanism that generates B-modes. At the surface of last scatter, in the absence of gravitational waves, my pattern looks entirely like this, purely E-modes. But the photons have to propagate from the surface of last scatter to us. They have to travel a distance of 13.8 billion light, uh, light years, basically. As they propagate through space, the, there are fluctuations in the density of the universe along the line of sight. And those fluctuations deflect the path of the photons. And as they deflect the path, as they move along that path, they get deflected by about three arc minutes. That's actually a pretty substantial deflection. That's large enough that your eye could see it. Your eye can resolve about, depends on your seeing, about, about an arc minute or so. So the photons we see have really been deflected significantly. When you deflect this pattern here in kind of so somewhat seemingly random ways, a bit of that E-like pattern will get distorted into a B-like pattern, because you've taken this picture above and stretched it. One of the very nice results that came out last year from our colleagues with the SBT South Pole Telescope was they made measurements of E and B polarization. And here's their measurement of E polarization. They then took measurements from the Planck telescope that told you how much, what was the uh, amplitude and galaxy fluctuations along the line of sight. They measured the integrated dust intensity from external galaxies. They took um, at Planck's higher frequencies, it sees mostly emission from galaxies. So those measurements tell us what is the field deflecting the fluctuations. Earlier work by the Planck team showed that this, the cosmic infrared background, the integrated light from dusty galaxies along the line of sight, correlates very well with fluctuations in the temperature fluctuations. So the SPT team took the E modes that they saw, took the cosmic in infrared background to predict the level of deflection, predicted the B modes that they should see, and correlated that with their observations using different frequency combinations. And what they found very nicely matched the predictions of our theory that the E modes, you know, gravity worked, E modes are being lens into B modes. And this is where we were with the study of microwave B uh, polarization fluctuations until last week. What happened last week was an announcement from the BICEP team of the detection of gravitational waves producing B-modes. And what they're doing, I view, is truly heroic science. They're going deep down to the South Pole, making extremely sensitive and difficult measurements. Um, one of the 
challenges with gravitational wave measurements is we don't know theoretically what amplitude to look for. So you don't know when you start your experiment what to expect. What made life easy with the temperature measurements was we had pretty of predictive theory. So we knew if we achieved a certain sensitivity, we would either falsify the theory or get an interesting detection. And for the polarization measurements looking at gravitational waves, uh, you don't know what you'll get. And you know, you have, uh, here's one of the heroes of this, this is Steve Richter, who spent three winter overs at the South Pole. Um, I'm told, I've met, he's a very calm guy. <laughs> he's on the paper. So, um, I mean, their winters. Their winters. <laughs> so their winters. Um, yeah, the South Pole is pretty cold in the winter. Um, my son's uh, studying geosciences at U Chicago. He's actually planning on going to McMurdo uh, to study glaciers in their summer, our winter. It turns out that this winter, McMurdo was on average significantly warmer than Chicago. So <laughs> as a U Chicago student, he'll be able to say that he's taking the winter semester off and going someplace warmer, Antarctica. <laughs> but that's true of McMurdo, not, not South Pole. And that's true of their summer, not, our win not their winter. Chicago, not New York. Yes. And yes. <laughs> I was, we were reminded often if we complained about this winter, it was much colder in Chicago. It was colder in Edmonton for much of the part of the winter than at the Mars Rover. That was an, another fun weather fact. All right, so I'm gonna talk some about the bicep experiment. And there are really three improving versions of the bicep experiment that we'll talk about. In 2006 to 2008, they operated the BICEP-1 experiment. That operated two frequencies, 100 and 150 gigahertz, and had about 50 detectors at each frequency. The fact they had the 100 gigahertz is gonna turn out to be very helpful because it gives us a measure of what's going on with the spectrum. From 2010 to 2012, they've been operating the BICEP-2 experiment, and that has 150 gigahertz detectors. And this will be the basis of what the results are. We'll also see some results from the Keck array, which is basically five copies of BICEP2 integrating together. So you have five times the number of detectors, so more sensitive maps. There'll be one plot that they provide in their paper from the Keck array with the words preliminary on it. Uh, and no description of the Keck array, but we do know what it, what it is. Um, we'll see. So when the, they took these measurements, and the amazing plot that came out was this one here. So this got us all, has gotten everyone extremely excited. This red curve is what we expect from gravitational lensing. The stash curve here is what we happens if you have gravitational waves. And the points here are the measurements from bicep two. And first thing you look at this and you just say, wow, they've seen gravitational waves. This is, yeah. So, so the red is the conversion of the B mode, the B mode that you talked about earlier? That's right, that's the lensing signal. And the dashed is when you add in the gravitational waves. So my first reaction is just this is incredible is the signature of inflation. We're seeing GR and quantum fluctuations near the Planck scale. Evidence for large field inflation. Profound implications for fundamental physics and cosmology. The SPT data you showed before would be higher on this The SPT data is here. And there's polar bear data here too. So there's ground, there are other experiments operating right around here with lying right on the, de the solid red curve. Yeah. You're like eight years or ten minutes ago you said you needed three frequencies of measurement? Uh, that's what they call foreshadowing in the movies. <laughs> we'll get to that. So that was my first reaction. Most people are still at the first reaction. 
the rest of this talk is going to be about this theme, which is important results deserve careful scrutiny. And I'm going to raise a bunch of questions about the bicep results. And, you know, when I first published my thesis and went to a conference and lots of people were asking questions and giving talks that were say, raising questions about some of the things we wrote, I was really upset. And then someone took me aside and said, it is a sign of respect when you take your time to check someone else's work. Because you're saying that work's important and it's worth my time to check. So I'm going to raise a whole bunch of questions here. But I, you know, uh, I do this with a sense of respect for my bicep colleagues because I think these results are so important. And I think we have to ask two questions about these results. The first is, is this signal on the sky? Have they actually seen something? The second is this signal due to the cosmic microwave background. So why do we worry about if the signal is on the sky? Well, that's because this B-mode signal is so weak. The amplitude of the signal is 100 nanokelvin. The fluctuations in the microwave background are about 100 microkelvin. So it's, the temperature fluctuations are 1,000 times brighter. And the uh, atmosphere is about a billion times brighter. So anything that can mix intensity into polarization can be a real problem. We even have to worry about things like mixing of E modes into B modes because those E mode signal is stronger than the B mode signal. So any uncertainty in your polarization direction in an experiment can cause problems. And I think E to B mode mixing actually is a potential contaminant and that's because the same team published a paper three months earlier that seems to have been ignored um, where they pointed out this is their correlation between temperature and B mode. There shouldn't be any unless there's an error in polarization direction. And between E and B mode. And they concluded that there was cosmic birefringence, that there was a scalar field filling the universe rotating E modes into B modes. And a paper that they submitted day before New Year's, they have a three sigma detection of cosmic birefringence. Um, I think this is probably suggesting they have a systematic in their experiment that's rotating E modes into B modes. And the amplitude of this is not big enough to explain what they've seen, but it gives you a sense that you have to be really careful. Yes? What you call lensing, though, is also E modes into that, so That's right, but on these angular scales, there are no, lensing shouldn't happen. So they saw something above the amplitude to expect from lensing. Because the, 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 the abscissa here is, is L? Is L. So it's, it's uh, my big worry on is the signal real is the, uh, intensity modes rotating to polarization modes. It's a big challenge for all these things. If this were to happen, there are a bunch of things you might expect to see. One is you would see an excess not just in B modes, but in E modes, because the, the contamination show up in both. In fact, they do see an excess E mode signal. It's about two sigma high. Now, two sigma sometimes happens. They could be looking at a patch of sky that has excess E modes, but it also could be internal contamination. And they've not published their paper on systematic tests, but they have published this table that shows um, various null tests. Remember, you know, null tests are often things that tell you something's awry. So they do things, for example, this telescope is a very nice design where you can take the whole telescope and rotate around the bore site. So you can look at the sky, same part of the sky, at four different orientations and make four independent maps and ask, do I see the same sky at four different orientations? And that doesn't test all systematics, but there was, there was something going on where scattered light was getting in, you might expect to see something different. Well, what's a little worrying is if they do that, here's their EE signal at four different orientations, 
the probability of finding that much difference between the two is at the 0.4% level. The same failure, well, a bit lower, higher rate from another, another pairing. They've done some other tests, like you can take the maps and split them where you say, let me take, uh, you saw those array of detectors, let me use the upper array and the lower array and make two independent maps and compare them. Well, they fail that jackknife as well with probabilities sometimes below a part in a thousand. And with the B modes, they fail the tests when they switch different ways of lo looking at the electronics. Where's the mux row? There we go. At below the percent level. Now with about a hundred different ways of doing jackknives, they should have a one, about one one percent failure. But they have seven. And that's just too many. And uh, suggests that there's some systematics. You can't tell, because they haven't published their systematics paper, whether that syst those systematics are con uh, a serious problem or not. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Foregrounds. I've mentioned that there's a bunch of different foregrounds. The thing they do to get around the foregrounds is they look at a very clean region of the sky where the foregrounds are minimal. And this plot is their plot explaining why they don't worry too much about foregrounds. Here is their signal that they expect, that they've seen in R modes. And their region of the sky, this is their estimate of dust. This is their estimate of synchrotron. This estimate is based on taking the WMAP 22 gigahertz data and extrapolating from 20, using the slope from 22 to 31 and extrapolating from those two points all the way down. Since we were the ones who made those measurements, I was a little surprised to see it done that way. Because if I was extrapolating to 100 gigahertz, I would have preferred to use the data at 94 to extrapolate to 100. <laughs> at 94, we find a slope not of minus 3.3, but minus 2.4. When you square that, which is what you do in power, that takes this curve and shifts it up to about there. So synchrotron contamination can be quite significant. And that gets worrying when I look at their best fit spectrum. And this is what the best fit spectrum would be for dust. This is what it should be for CMB. And this is their best fit. And this is what it should be for synchrotron. And the spectrum actually looks a bit more like synchrotron than dust. And the synchrotron than CMB. What they say in their paper is it differs from dust by two sigma, which is correct. But it's actually a better fit to synchrotron. That fit becomes even better when you include the fact that there is some residual dust there. What that will always do is shift the curve this way. The fit becomes even better if you use not a slope of minus 3.3, but 2.4, which was our best measurement there. So I think they have not convincingly shown that this is not all, or not significant amount of synchrotron. There are other things that worry me. If you look at so, uh, the measurements with the Keck array, the signal's very different from the BICEP2 array. So to go back to these results here, the amplitude of the B-mean modes here are much higher than the theoretical prediction. And this is supposed to be due to lensing. Now some people say, oh, don't worry, the Keck array, the numbers get better. It's not really fair to play that game. I think it's better to ask, look at the consistency test and say, they're looking at the same part of the sky. Why does the point, why, if I take Keck minus bicep 2, which should have no signal, cross bicep 2, I see shifts of more than two sigma on most points, which suggests they're not seeing a consistent sky between the two experiments. So if, if you're comparing the 
comparing the, the, the black dots and, crosses, and the crosses. And you're saying they should that be. inconsistency should worry you wherever it occurs. Yeah. Because it's the, you're looking at the same sky, and the experiment should be seeing the same thing. So can you say a word about the error bar in there? Because there's a, I mean, it's hard to, those error bars are. Like, are statistic, they're statistical errors? So they're uncorrelated between the Keck part and whatever, all of the things that you're looking at the same side of the sky. They're, look, um, they're actually correlated, so the dip, in that half, you know, the errors are coming both from noise and bicep 2 and Keck, and they're common between the two bicep 2 points. So when you take the difference between the two points, the total error is less than the error summed in quadrature. So what you do by I overestimates the total error. So I think there are a bunch of tests I'd like to see the team perform that the, they could do with the data they have. They have 100 gigahertz data from BICEP1, just measure the cross power, the power spectrum to see if it's synch more synchronous evidence for synchrotron. I've mentioned this, the Keck data. They should take the Keck data across the BICEP data, measure its spectrum, not just the BICEP2. They can take the Keck minus BICEP2 cross BICEP2. A test I'd really like to see done to test whether this really is on the sky polarization is they should see lensing of E modes into B modes. We know, we, we know the amplitude to expect we know what the cosmic infrared background is. What really surprises me about this part is about a third of the BICEP team were co-authors on the paper having this detection. Now, I happen to know they're not the people who did the analysis or the people who built part of the instrument, but they should be knowledgeable enough to know that you can do this test, which will be a very, use will be a very useful test. There are things you could do to check to see if it's foregrounds. You can correlate the polarization measurements with the Planck 143 and 100 gigahertz data and 353 gigahertz data. These are publicly available. The WMAP 22 gigahertz data. And most importantly, they should publish their systematics paper and discuss their null tests. And, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit harsh, but they've had big press releases. They've not submitted this paper for refereeing. And, um, you know, Stanford is already doing, beginning the campaign for Linde's Nobel Prize. So, you know, before you do that, they should do these tests. And, um, you know, fortunately, we will test all this. I'm running a little late, so let me actually skip implications, because there's lots of people here who can talk about that, um, and turn to uh, what's the next steps. Next step is going to be tested. And what's beautiful about this result, in terms of its impact, on, it's very important. It really changes the way we think about things. And it's really testable. And important results get tested. And we have six experiments that will test this in the next two years. Planck already has data that is, uh, should be in, that they have in hand that should test this. Planck should have the sensitivity to get to R of 0.1, possibly 0.05. And they will be sensitive on the same scales. Um, the South Pole Telescope uh, is pushing to the larger angular scales and will look at the same patch of the sky. The polar bear experiment has also measured BB lensing, is also going to look at the same patch of the sky. These experiments are both at 150 gigahertz, so they won't be able to test the, whether it's synchrotron or not, but they'll confirm the measurements. ACPOL will look at a different patch of the sky, but equally as deep, probably this year. And then there are a pair of balloon flights that should be more sensitive than any of these ground or space-based experiments. Um, to these polarization modes. The SPIDER experiment, led by Bill Jones, there at Princeton, was supposed to have flown this winter. But it was all set to go in Antarctica, and then sequestration took place. NSF pulled everything out of Antarctica during sequestration and canceled the flight. And because you have to fly at just the right time, 
they have to wait a year. And the, a bunch of these poor graduate students are sitting around waiting a year because of the Tea Party. So those of you who support the Tea Party, <laughs> and I'm sure there are many here, remember the price it pays does for science. The beautiful thing about Spider is it has multiple frequencies and will go much deeper. So we'll have a very nice test with this. This is the EBEX experiment. Um, Amber Miller uh, up at Columbia is one of the leaders of that experiment. They flew this winter. Unfortunately, they had some problems with their electronics. They're working on their data now. My understanding is they probably won't have the sensitivity with the data they have in hand. But they're flying again this coming winter and they'll test it. So if all goes well, we will have six experiments within the next 18 months that will confirm this result. Sorry, but why do these balloons kind of fly in the Arctic? Um, they take advantage of the circumpolar current. The Antarctic is, because of the, um, you, you know, around 60 south, it's water all the way around. So there's a very strong circumpolar water current, which isolates Antarctica actually from the rest of the planet effectively uh, in terms of its weather. There's also a very strong circumpolar wind current. So if you, in, in November and December, if you launch a balloon from McMurdo Station, it goes up, spends two weeks going around Antarctica, comes right back, drops down, uh, quite, you know, sometimes within a mile of where you let it go. And you get two weeks of really smooth, beautiful data in Antarctica if everything goes well. So it's a very nice site for this. Um, I'm running late, but let me just quick, very quickly just show you. This is the expected sensitivity for Planck. That's for R of 0.2. That's their sensitivity curves with systematics. They should get that. Looking further ahead, this is um, from Toby Marriage. Toby Marriage and Chuck Bennett are building an experiment called Class at Hopkins that they're hoping to deploy. This shows their expected sense. This will probably be two, three years from now. So this is where we go next after confirming it. This is their signal at R of 0.2. This is their noise level. They will have about 100 sigma detection by the time this is done. That means the ability to measure tensor modes. And this experiment's designed to go after the lowest multiples they can get to. We're, we have a proposal into the MSIP co competition for the ACT experiment, which I'm part of. Uh, we didn't know about B modes, we put the proposal in at R of 0.2. So we wrote a proposal saying we could detect things at 0.01. And I've just re ran our numbers, we can get to 120 sigma if uh, the signal's at that level. So I think on the experimental side, there's just tremendous possibility. And uh, this result has really, you know, on one hand, I uh, say two, three words about implications. On one hand, this result has confirmed our ideas about inflation, um, suggested that we're moving in the right, you know, uh, all sorts of important connections in fundamental physics, but the signal's at a bit, an amplitude that's a bit higher than we expected, and much, and particularly given our temperature measurements. So it suggests in order to reconcile it with our temperature measurements, we might have to put a cutoff scale in our inflationary theory. It's, uh, in some ways, uh, for theory, it is about the most tempting thing possible. It's close to what our theory is expected, but not quite what we expected. And it suggests lots of interesting new directions. So it's, good, you know, very exciting, you know. So in, to conclude, this is very important if true. Thanks. You can do a whole series of those, and you can do a lot with the Planck data. Um, Planck data, Planck will not go as deep as these experiments, but will cover more sky. 
But Planck will give us a lot of information about polarization foregrounds that we can use somewhat, sometimes statistically and sometimes on a given region of the sky. Um, the Planck 343 gig at 343 gigahertz, Planck will be dominated by galactic dust, which will be much brighter. So even though they don't have the sensitivity to see the C and B polarization on a single patch, they'll see the dust polarization. So we'll have a very good dust template. So I think the combination of having that and the WMAP templates at the lower frequencies um, should be quite useful. So. If, R, if R is 0.2, quite good. Because at that signal, you know, we, you can see we have a 100 sigma signal across a pretty wide range of scale. So we should be able to test that, which will be, you know, uh, on the experimental side, I see the, you know, next step is confirm. If it is confirmed, next step is measure NT. Uh, for class, um, the uh, class is, is ready to go. They have some. Pro they need to negotiate some things with the Chilean government for deployment. That's actually their current biggest thing. For ACPOL, um, NSF has to. You know, they have 12 mi uh, things in the mid-scale competition. They will fund four. They have to choose wisely. Or someone gives us 10 million dollars. So it's. I mean, they're not that. You know, it's. So it's just real money, but you know, it's not, the detectors are there. But you said that the, one of the problems with these polarization modes as opposed to the temperature fluctuation is that you didn't know the, the amplitudes you were looking at. Is that without inflation you don't know it, or, uh, or, or doesn't inflation predict the amplitude? Um, the amplitude depends on the energy scale of inflation. We don't know a priori what the energy scale of inflation is. A particular model of inflation tells you what its you know, prediction will be for that value. So, you know, someone, you write down inflation where the potential is m squared phi squared. For that potential, I know what the amplitude is. If the, but different potentials will have different predicted amplitudes. Radically different. And Radically still different. Fit everything else. Yeah, yeah. So that that has been sort of the concern that you know the worry was you do these experiments and uh, you don't you work very hard you get the limit to ten to the minus three and everyone says oh glad you did that but we have half the models in some space uh, predict lower values. Basically, the amplitude of the fluctuations depend on how far the field has to move during inflation. We divide the models into large field models with the distance the field moves large compared to the Planck scale. Those predict detectable gravitational waves. And they're small field models where the field doesn't move very much. Those don't predict, they, those would not predict a detectable level. The fact that we've seen this, if it's confirmed, implies we have large field models. Thanks. What? Well, you have an observer. You have only data related things on this slide. I know for this talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah.